friends, the reruns are over at last. I'm Tom, and the color cast is on the air now for Monday, the 22nd of March, 1999. Roger Ebert, fresh from the Oscars here in Los Angeles last night, is with us, along with uh, Oscar winner Keiko Eby, uh, who made a documentary on uh, old people that won the Academy Award for Best Doc uh, here in Southern California last night. I spent a wonderful week in my beloved Northern California and traveled by car. Uh, back to L.A. on Saturday in the 10-hour drive from hell. You know, I, I followed the rainstorm all the way down the coast. It began with a one-hour and 45-minute delay on a stretch of road in Tiburon, California. They apparently had a gas leak up there, and they had to dig up the whole road, and naturally they dug it up right at a stoplight. And they turned the stoplight to a flashing light, so every car had to stop and then go through. And the police, who I am assuming were sent out to direct traffic, were too busy watching the gas company people dig the hole. So we were there for an hour and 45 minutes. Thank you so very much. Planning is tough, I know. Uh, I watched the Oscar Awards last night, and I, 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 I was prepared for the moment of controversy when Elia Kazan came out to receive his honorary lifetime award. And we'll talk about that with Roger Ebert uh, in some length uh, later on. But all last week on the news on the local channels, they kept pointing to this controversy involving Mr. Kazan. And for those of you who are too young to recall, he... Uh, was one of those who named names during the witch hunts of the McCarthy era back in the 1940s and 1950s, people who possibly were members of the Communist Party. It was not a very pretty picture in America at that time. And Mr. Kazan apparently ruined the careers of some people by naming them as communists or sympathizers when in fact they were not. And there was a body of opinion out in California that he should not have received the award last night. But be that as it may, it stunned me to hear a local news anchor in San Francisco identify the period as the MacArthur period. You would think that people who anchor the news would read enough about American history or a story of that magnitude and know it was the McCarthy era and not the, uh, the MacArthur era, uh, era. But then again, little surprises me anymore. This is our last Monday night together. We do five shows, and then uh, the new show takes over a week from tomorrow night. Craig Kilborn on The Late Late Show here on CBS. And I was flattered today as I drove into the lot to notice that there were two or three guys standing out at the bus stop. Have you seen these guys? They're dressed up. They look like me, and they have the, you know, the comb over and all that. <laughs> and they have a big sign that says, honk if you'll miss Tom. There wasn't one horn blowing on them. <laughs> Everybody sailed by, like, get them, out, get them out of here. If you check the listings, we had planned to have Alec Baldwin here tonight. And sadly, he's got the flu or a bug, which is going around out here in Southern California, and he couldn't make it. So uh, in his place, I want to show a bit of videotape that uh, we did back in August of 1997 when Alec was here. And he told the story about playing baseball as a kid and losing his attention span during the game. Here is Alec Baldwin from August of 1997. When I was a kid, I was playing baseball. Uh, there was a woman who lived in our neighborhood who gave, uh, she was studying for her psychology thesis, and she gave IQ tests to all the kids in the neighborhood mm -hmm. when I was like seven or eight. Yeah. And uh, if I do say so myself, I did pretty well on this test. And my mother, of course, ran with that. You know, I mean, that wasn't the, my excuse for everything. My boy is a genius, My right. son is a genius. He can't, my father used to say that to me. He used to say to me, well, you know, driving is tough because it's so easy. He said, it's so distracting. Uh, you know, if you're a bad driver, it's sometimes because it's, it's just so easy, you can't concentrate. You know, if you're a genius, you know what I mean? So I was playing baseball one time, and uh, I was in Little League, and I was in the, in the outfield, and very Walter Mitty-ish, you know, I, I suddenly tune out the game entirely. There's a guy over there, he's, you know, raking his leaves, and I'm thinking, I wonder what that guy's life is like. <laughs> I wonder what, where he met his wife. <laughs> How long have they Jeez. lived in that house? And now the guy's up to plat, the pitcher's winding up, and I'm going, and I wonder how many children he has, and what kind of a future he wants for his family. The pitch goes over the plate, crack, the guy hits the ball right at me. I'm deaf now. I'm not even tuned yeah. in. Yeah. And the ball is hissing toward me and whistling over my head, and I can't see all the players on my team going, what are you doing? And I'm sitting there going, and I wonder what he had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> And all of a sudden, right as the ball goes funk on the ground and goes rolling past me, I snap out of it and I hear all the sound of people screaming and people looking at me and I'm going, huh? What? What? I run and get the ball, three runs score, we lose the game, I walk back in and my, a big word that people used back then, coaches, they would say the word, when I, mean, I was a kid, their favorite word was hump. Hump, yeah. So I walked in, the guy goes, nice play, Baldwin. You hump. <laughs> 
That's what that was. That was the, I don't know what it meant. They'd always say that. If you didn't have your jock at gym that day, the gym teacher would say, all right, jock check. And they'd make you pull your pants down. And he'd say, no jock for you, Baldwin. You hump. <laughs> they'd kind of groan under their breath, you hump. Baldwin, you hump. So I walk in after the play, and the guy goes, nice play, Baldwin. You hump. <laughs> and my mother comes bolting out of the stands and goes, how dare you speak to him that way? He can't concentrate on this silly game because he's a genius. <laughs> and I look at my mother, and I'm going, no, no, shh, no, no, shh. Please, no, Mom, no. He's a genius. He can't be bothered with these silly games. Mrs. Baldwin, sit down, you hump. <laughs> and... The guy looked at me for the rest of the thing. He'd sit there and he'd go, all right, second base, Baker. Third base, Wilson. Right field, genius. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a funny moment, wasn't it, huh? By the way, uh, tomorrow night, uh, Tony Curtis is here and our friend David Milch from NYPD Blue. On Wednesday, Bonnie Hunt will join us. On Thursday, we have David Letterman and Tom Brokaw. And Friday, our last night here, we have Dennis Miller. And, of course, you on the toll-free and a couple of other surprises. So a lady is at the workplace, and a fellow walks by. He says, gee, he says, your hair smells terrific. And she immediately rushes to the supervisor to report him for sexual harassment. Supervisor says, well, what did he say? She says, my hair, she says, he said, my hair smelled terrific. He says, how can that be sexual harassment? She said, he's a midget. I'm Tom, you're watching <laughs> CBS, and thanks for catching our pictures as we fly him through the air. <laughs> I am not ready. <laughs> it seemed that Oscar night belonged to Roberto Benigni, whose exuberance was infectious, and to the movie Shakespeare in Love, which won Best Picture of the Year. Roger Ebert, our pal, joins us now for a look at the award show and some other stuff. Rog, thanks for coming on, and welcome back to CBS. How are you doing? Nice okay? to be here. I'm doing fine. You know, Up I late saw, last night, but here I am. I saw you last night uh, with the parties, you know, on the local channel here, and I saw you before the ceremonies on the uh, red, carpet, red carpet interviewing the celebrities. What... You did not seem comfortable to me doing that. Is that a tough assignment? Uh, I was comfortable doing it. It's tough because you don't know. First of all, the sun is directly behind the celebrities. Perfect. You know, and it's setting. So you can't, you see dark silhouettes with famous noses approaching. You. Right, so it's hard to know who's coming you your way. You don't know who you're talking to. Then, the moment you're talking to somebody, somebody else comes along. So you have to kind yeah. of move them along. G you know, get rid of Benigni, here comes Hanks. Get rid of Hanks, here's Spielberg. Yeah. And then, of course, what can you ask them that isn't kind of stupid? Are you looking forward? You know, ho hope you'll win. Mm -hmm. Are you nervous? Yeah, right. Um, Who are you wearing? Yeah, right. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I enjoy doing it. I enjoyed it. Well, it was a fun day and a fun mm -hmm. night to watch. Now, let me ask you here about in the auditorium when Roberto Benigni won the award mm -hmm. uh, for Best Foreign Picture of the Year. He began walking on the backs of chairs yes. down. I kept thinking, my God, what if he steps on somebody, falls these on somebody? These women spend $50,000 on these dresses, and he's walking on them. I mean, it's your worst <laughs> nightmare. You take it back. Some of them, you know, they're, they're, they borrow them from the designer, sure, and then it comes back sure. with Benigni's footprints on it. <laughs> of course, that probably makes it more valuable. But... He, if he broke his leg, it would be very dramatic, right? They would have to carry him onto the stage. But yet, it was a transcendent moment, Tom. It was like it was wonderful. Palance with the one-arm push-ups. Mm -hmm. That will be in the clip packages of Oscar highlights for the next 100 years. His joy, his exuberance. And the audience loved him. Yes. I mean, they just absolutely cheered him. And I thought the... the the symbolism of having Sophia Loren there mm -hmm. to present him with this Oscar because I believe she was one of the first to win. She won for a foreign language performance and two women. Two women. And now he won. So they're the two. A Joseph, the e, a Joseph E. Levine production. Yes, yes it was. Yeah. And so she opens the envelope and she says, Roberto. Yeah, yeah. And then he jumps up. What he did, I was at the Cannes Film Festival when the film won second prize last May, Grand Jury Prize. He gets up, he falls flat on his stomach and kisses Scorsese's feet, the head of the jury, <laughs> then pulls himself up Scorsese's designer suit, you know, and kisses him on both cheeks, works his way through the entire jury, kissing every single jury member, leads the applause. Now comes the grand prize winner, Angelopoulos from Greece, you know. It's like he lost. I mean, he, got, he only won the first prize. Oh, here I am, you know. I'm chopped liver. What do you make of Benini? Is he for real? Huh? He is like that. I don't know. I, you know, his wife is so sweet and so nice. Yeah. 
uh, Violetta Brasci. I wonder what it's like to be married to him. I hope he's not like that at home. <laughs> oh, we're having a toast for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but he is so outgoing, and, and he's, he's a very popular star in I, I wondered if, if the Sophia Loren thing were impromptu, that she was going to present this award, no. or if the Academy probably had a hunch that Life is Beautiful would win the best foreign film, I think so they slotted her to make that presentation. I feel everybody had a real good hunch that it would win for best foreign film, but they allegedly, and I'm sure it's true, they don't know. They don't know who's going to win, but it was a real good bet, mm -hmm. and it was perfect drama. What about the hunch on Benini for best actor, though? Long shot. I huh? did not predict that. I predicted Shakespeare in Love for best film. I did not think he would win for best actor, and, uh, and he did. And he did, and you know, people love that film. I should have had my ear closer to the ground because all during Oscar season, people were talking about Shakespeare in Love and they're talking about Private Ryan and then they get that little look in their eyes. Yeah. You know? But I really like that uh, Life is Beautiful. That yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. And you should, I should have realized that. You mentioned Shakespeare in Love versus Private Ryan. A lot of people were betting on Private Ryan yeah. to win Best Picture. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Uh, I think it's the persistence of memory phenomenon. Uh, you remember pleasure, uh, it, it, your memory of pleasure disintegrates as p time passes. I'm sure you've noticed okay. that in your life. Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, they saw the movie. Not that much time, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few minutes sometimes. What did I do last night? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they saw Private Ryan last July. There you go. They saw Shakespeare in Love last month or this month. They maybe saw it a week before they marked their ballots. It's very fresh in their minds. It's a very entertaining picture. It's a charming picture. It's a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And then they had to think back for eight months. Now, it, it's insulting. Yeah, even though they re-released Private Ryan, you well, know. But just no, but if you've seen it once, you don't necessarily, you have all these tapes the Academy sends sure. out. You don't necessarily see it a second time. I think if Private Ryan had come out in December, it would have won. Really? Yeah, I frankly, you think I, timing is that much both of a pictures were in my top ten last year, but I think Private Ryan was the better picture and the one more likely to be remembered and studied in twenty or thirty years. You know, I went to see a picture last week called Waking Ned Divine, and oh, I, yeah, I, I didn't know what yeah. to expect. I mean, what a joy that picture! On was. our show, we asked, we have a memo to the Academy, which basically is, please nominate these people. We said, please nominate David Kelly. Oh, please, the scrawny guy on <laughs> oh, the motorbike. Oh my God! The, Give with, him a nomination with the face, with the cigarette hanging out. I mean, the greatest face, one of the greatest faces on film. Wouldn't you love to see Benigni and Kelly next to each other in a shot with Oscars? And, I mean, it yeah. would be... And now, uh, when the show is on the air, after you finish the, uh, the uh, interviews with, as they're coming in, do you go to the press room? Yeah, I'm in the press room. And what goes on in there while the show is on the air? Uh, everybody is sitting in front of a portable computer trying to watch a monitor that is further away than any monitor in this studio with people standing up in front of it. You have earphones so you can hear what's going on on TV. Meanwhile, people come out who just won. Right. They're holding their Oscars. They're like rabbits in the headlights. They have no idea they're going to have to face the press. And they're being interviewed on loudspeakers. So that you have their interview booming in one ear while the television is booming in the other ear. I'm and you're trying, trying to, to see who has won Best Actor. While meanwhile, James Coburn is giving his theories for the treatment of arthritis. <laughs> he got backstage. He, didn't, he talked a little about the movie. Basically, it was that the arthritis establishment is spending their money in the wrong way. And I finally, after 10 years, took things into my own hand and cured my own arthritis. And uh, so I know how well, to see, do that's it that's why he came down there, to get that off yeah. his chest. Right. Yeah. Now, I was able to pick up on the satellite last night, the press room, and there was one guy or gal who asked every uh, winner... Oh, I know. What did you do? Exactly. And she, she, but, but Coburn's answer was great. Well, Coburn said, I got up, I had a piece of toast, and I waited for my wife to get dressed. Right. And that took up the rest of the day. <laughs> That's right. But he, very gallantly, he added, but it was worth it. Uh, we are chatting here with uh, Roger Ebert, uh, who reviews movies uh, in Chicago in the papers and on television. Back with Roger and you on the toll-free after this break. We'll have guests, we'll laugh hard, and share many collibations. Cairo, Hong Kong. Richard on the toll free in Amarillo, Texas. Hi, Richard, and welcome to CBS. Hello. Hello, how are you, Tom? I'm fine, thanks. Hope you are, Richard. What, did, you, did you enjoy the Oscar show last night? Yes, I did, except I wanted to ask Mr. Ebert a question. Sure, go ahead. Well, what do you think about Spielberg winning Best Director, but he didn't win the Best Movie? 
It seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? If you are the best director of the year, why didn't you direct the best film? And I think in a case like this, Spielberg was a much more known quantity in Hollywood to the voters than the director of Shakespeare in Love. But they liked Shakespeare in Love better, and they simply split their ballots, which is illogical, but it's what they did. You know who gains stature every year? Tom Hanks. Yes. He is a man of immense... He is a classy guy. Yeah, yeah. And he's a nice guy. Yeah. And he's happily married, and his wife is along with him. She's a wonderful woman. Rita Wilson. Yeah. They're just... They're the kind of people that you want everybody but to But I be. mean his, his empathy for the people of the World War II generation mm -hmm. and his sense of feeling. I mean, w mm -hmm. when he won the Oscar the second time, that acceptance speech, I mean, I'll never mm -hmm. forget it, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's just a, he's not afraid to display emotion, but he does it with such ease and, as you say, with such class. And he introduced John Glenn last night. Yeah, yeah. He loves space. Well, of course, he did the TV series, sure. Apollo 13. Uh, it's his, he would rather be an astronaut than a movie star. He's a movie star. <laughs> Richard, I'm glad you called him. Thanks for watching our show tonight. Tom, we love your show. We're sorry to see you go. I understand, yes, Richard, but it's, but it's the best for all of us, believe me. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate right. that. Okay. Thanks, Bunt. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Uh -huh, Gwyneth Paltrow, a movie star, huh? Yes. Yeah. Tall, regal, self-possessed, beautiful, talented. Ian McKellen last night, uh, I was asking him why the British have done so well in the Oscars recently, including, turned out, the winner. <laughs> used a British accent, she's American. He said, and a flawless British accent. Oh, really? Well, when Ian McKellen says your accent is flawless, that's a review. And she's good. She's got the technical stuff in addition to the beauty and the presence and so forth. Now, Judy Dench, who won for Best Supporting mm -hmm. Actress, I believe, which was a surprise to a lot of people. I think I many, predicted it. Uh, oh, did you? Well, mm -hmm. Good for you. Mm -hmm. But many people thought Lynn Redgrave was a shoe in here for her work in uh, Gods and Monsters. Yeah, and also, of course, there's, I, I hate to analyze in this way, but sometimes when you have misfortune in your personal life, it helps you with the voters. Uh, Judy Dench, of course, is one of the greatest actresses alive, but she's not really known to moviegoers, except for the last couple of years with the James Bond pictures and Mrs. Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, but she came in at the end of the, what turned out to be the year's most popular picture and controlled it. I mean, as Queen Victoria, or Queen Elizabeth, she calls all the shots. She assigns roles. She gives permission. She gives judgment. She puts down the bad guy and so forth. She has all of the best scenes in the, obviously, the last eight minutes. It's a very short role, but a very important one. That's right. And people remembered it and they responded to it. That's what a supporting role is for. Tell me about this whole thing of supporting actor mm -hmm. and supporting actress. How did this evolve over the years? Well, you know, in the golden years of Hollywood, uh, sometimes supporting actors have more screen time than the stars. Because the big studios, like Warner Brothers, they would want Humphrey Bogart to make four movies a year. Right. So they didn't want him in every scene. No, not Today, when you pay somebody $20 million, you want to see him on screen for 120 minutes. In those days, Bo in Casablanca, Bogart is maybe on screen 30 or 40 percent of the time. And you have Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Lorre and Claude Rains and Paul Henry you know, come to and the bartender it, it, and the croupier. As I look back, and I, now you're right, Bogart mm -hmm. is not through that picture uh, all, all the time. No, and they were character stars. People looked forward to Peter Lorre when he turned up in a movie. Now... You don't have that. You have the star and the two other people who are above the title, and they're in the whole movie. And you don't get these, these colorful people who come in uh, and swell the progress of a scene or two, as, as the poet has it. Peter Lorre. Oh, no, Roger. Don't do that to him. Yes, and Sidney Greenstreet. I mean to have that little item, sir. <laughs> I mean to have it. The Elia Kazan controversy. Mm -hmm. We heard about it all week on the news last week, both local and network. When he walked on stage last night, I, I, people clapped for him. I mean, there were some who said... Army Archer estimated about 20% of the people stood up. I don't know because I was watching on television. I guessed a little more than that. But let me just tell you one, without getting into the controversy. Yeah. Scorsese put together that montage. He's been very influenced by Kazan. Uh, on the Waterfront was a great influence on Raging Bull. He did an interesting thing. He ends with Terry Malloy, Marlon Brando, leading the men back to working on the Waterfront. That's right. And the music swells up to a triumphant conclusion. Now, he holds the music, he continues the music, he cuts to a picture of Kazan, and the music continues to build for about 15 seconds. It was like the montage had a built-in ovation. Oh, sure, So sure. that by the time you see him, you're responding to him like a movie character. It was Scorsese, the movie director, doing a very clever thing to try to bridge that embarrassment of people not knowing mm -hmm. how to react. And as it turned out, they reacted according to their consciences. Some people stood up. 
Some people remain seated with their arms folded like Ed Harris and Nick Nolte and Amy Madigan. Steven, Steven Spielberg split the difference. He remained seated, Steven but he applauded. applauded. Right, right. I think he was applauding for the work and remaining seated for the man. Very, very good analogy. Uh, who got robbed last night? Jim Carrey? He, you know, but his speech. Yeah, it was wonderful, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's not whether you win or not, it's whether you get nominated. He was, he would be a great MC. I think Jim Carrey would be a great MC. He got robbed. Truman Show, a real good movie. I think people were kind of startled that it wasn't nominated. Pleasantville, another one that probably should have gotten nominated. But every year, somebody gets robbed. Yep. Nobody ever remembers who loses. They only remember you who You know who won. I think should have an Oscar or two and doesn't have one, I guess, is Morgan Freeman. The best, as Pauline Kael said, is there a better actor in America I than can't Morgan think of Freeman? One. I can't think of one. No, he is the best. He is so good. He has such authority. And think of the pictures he's made. The one at the high school back in New Jersey. Then he oh, did yeah. Glory, which was a great oh, picture. Yeah. I mean, he's done some great movies. And, and even in uh, thrillers like Seven. He's yeah. very good yeah. in Seven. Yeah. Yes. And Driving Miss Daisy. You thought he was such a tough guy, and then you saw Driving Miss Daisy. Yeah, look at his range. Go figure. No oh, Oscar. Morgan Freeman, if his name is on a picture, I want to go see that picture. Me too. I have to pause again. We're chatting here with Roger Ebert. More with Roger and you as time permits. After this, for our sponsors and the CBS television stations all across America. On the toll-free with uh, Roger Ebert, here is Greg calling from Nova Scotia. Hi, Greg. How are you? Hello, Mr. Snyder. I'm fine, Pleasure Greg. How are you? Show. Good, sir. Thank you. I'd like to ask Mr. Ebert, if mm -hmm. I could, um, what's in his background that allows him to be such a good movie critic? Gee, thanks. Um, <laughs> experience. I've been a movie critic a while. Books. Catholic school. <laughs> I had great nuns who encouraged me to read and to think and to be whoever I was. Great high school, great college, and uh, the Princess Theater on Main Street in Urbana, Illinois. And a love for movies. And a love for movies, yeah, and to see those movies when I was a kid. Gene Autry and Roy Rogers, they had a tribute last night. They were my heroes. How about the horse last night? They couldn't get the horse to stand. I was hoping that horse would make Academy history. How about you? Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> what? And leave showbiz? Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Did you watch the show last night, Greg? Uh, yes, I did. What? It, was, it was good. Um, I thought Whippy was a bit over the top. Yeah, well, she was. But as she said, I'll probably never be asked to do this again. Mm -hmm. So she, she went full bore last night. Could I ask Mr. Ebert's opinion? Uh, my favorite movie is Pappy Long with Steve McQueen. Mm -hmm. What does he think of that movie? I haven't seen it since it came out. It no, wouldn't no, be my uh, favorite movie, but I wouldn't want to say any more than that until I saw it again. It's been at least 20 years since oh, I've okay. seen it. Greg, I'm glad you called, and thanks for watching. You're a gentleman, Mr. Snyder. Thank you. Okay, good night, Greg, and bye be bye. well. I thought for a second last night when they did the in memoriam mm -hmm. that they forgot Gene, uh, Gene Siskel. And then Whoopi mentioned him, mm -hmm. and that was such a wonderful moment. In the press room, there was applause. And uh, Jean was a great guy. I was really touched that she did that. That was really nice of her. Really nice. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why he wasn't in, well, I guess be, not being a member of the Academy. Uh, I think you have to be a member of that Academy family to get into the montage. And I can kind of understand that because every year a lot of people die who maybe don't qualify. And that's mm -hmm. the way they look mm -hmm. at it. But I think that in the world of movies... Gene made a great contribution, and it was very appropriate and very nice. You know, Raj, I almost knew that his story was not going to have a happy ending. You could almost sense it. And um... We believed, uh, we wanted to believe what he told us. And, you know, he kept it very private. He yes, didn't he want did. to talk about his health. He didn't want any pity. He didn't want people to treat him as if he was sick. And I could tell that he was uncomfortable and in pain and having difficulty sometimes. But I kind of just believed him, just wanted to believe him. I didn't know that his last show was his last show. He left the building without saying goodbye to anyone. He didn't want to say goodbye. When you found out he was gone? It was like an enormous presence in my life was missing. I mean, I've been pushing against this guy and pushing with this guy for years, even before we were on TV. He was like my big competitor, then he was my partner on the television show. And uh, I miss him every day. He was a very smart guy. And we had a shorthand, a verbal shorthand. Right. Uh, there are phrases that we use that I can't use anymore. They don't mean anything to anyone else. And where did this uh, come from? The Romans. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, we did. We. I mean, I mean for you and for you on the G. previous show, we had yes votes and no votes. Yeah. Then we left to go. Uh, we left Tribune Entertainment to go to Buena Vista, and we felt that we had the ch that would be intellectual property. You know, on television. Yeah. Right. right. Voting yes and voting no. Oh, that's intellectual property. So we came up with thumbs up and thumbs down, which turned out to be the best thing we ever did. Uh -huh. Did the audience catch on right away? Did you get feedback on it from? People? I guess. I guess. Yeah. And it was uh, nice in the ads because then they don't misquote you. <laughs> That's right. You know, they either it's two thumbs up or it's not. It's not like uh, you say it was an incredible disaster and they say incredible. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> and the future of, uh, of, uh, of Ebert. We have a series of guest hosts coming in. We have um, um, Ken Turan of the LA Times. Mm -hmm. Next week, then we have Joel Siegel of Good Morning oh, America. Sure. Then we have Joel. Ruby Rich, who is a film critic from San Francisco. Then I believe we're going to have Harry Knowles, who is the famous proprietor of the Ain't It Cool uh, website, uh, and various other people will be coming in. We've had Tom Shales, we had Howie Mobshevitz. Uh, and so eventually we just settle on one. If one just shines through, breaks through, there's chemistry well, with you. And possibly, but we're not, that isn't our agenda right now. Our agenda right now is to just uh, uh, sample a large group of film critics, people who have credentials and the ability to talk about films. And uh, it's just too soon to start looking for a replacement. I understand. I yeah. understand. I remember your first network television appearance. You, you should. You were there. I know. You were there. You put us on television. Yeah, I did. Tom Snyder, The Tomorrow Show. Yeah, yeah. And Cisco We heard and I, about these two kids out in Chicago. We were on PBS, and you wanted us on national television, and we were scared. Really? And uh, we came into that set. It was in New York. You had the cigarette. And uh, you put us at ease because it was conversational. You, you know, you have a good way with guests. You are interested. You know, your questions, you listen, and then it follows. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like you have to have this whole agenda in your mind in order to be a guest with Tom Snyder. You just have to be able to, yeah, but I remember to we, talk. I remember we saw this, uh, this, uh, this thing with these two guys from the two competing newspapers. We said, yeah. let's, get, let's bring these guys uh -huh. in and find out what they're all about. Well, that was our, uh, that was our national debut because I don't think we were fully national on PBS at that no, point. I then. think we were on regional PBS. We had the New England Network and the Rocky Mountain Network, right, and, uh, right. and you put us on, so thank you. Well, you've done good, kid. I'm, I'm <laughs> proud to know you, and thanks for all your kindness through the years. Be well, my friend, okay. okay? Roger Ebert, who can be seen on the, what do they call that show now? It's called Cisco and Ebert. Cisco, he mm -hmm. can be seen on Cisco. I like that. That's good. He can be seen on Siskel and Ebert uh, all across America. Check the listings for the time and station. Next, uh, Academy Award winner uh, Keiko Eby, who was a big sensation last night. Huh? Yes, she yeah. was. She had that audience in the yeah. palm of her hand. Uh, we'll be right back with her and you on the toll-free after these messages. You've all gotten what you wanted in this deal. B6, dual sliding doors, etc., etc. What about my client? Where's his share? Who's looking out for him? Jackie Childs, that's who. What's he need with nine cup holders? What about nine bottle holders? Oh, yeah, you like that, don't you? <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> What's that? Nothing. <laughs> The all-new seven-passenger, nine-bottle-holding, something-for-everyone Honda Odyssey. It's one big happy minivan. Tomorrow night, along with you on the toll-free and in your home.